Our Sunday night journey has been taking a path through church history. Tonight we're going to step to the next phase, probably a little more of the most common known, I guess I would say. You're going to hear a name tonight that is very well known. All of us have heard of the man Martin Luther, Martin Luther. Last Sunday night, we looked at the kind of the beginnings, the rumblings of the Reformation. We saw the beginning of it. I still contend in my study of history that the actual real impetus of the Reformation actually, in my view, had more to do with the Bible than it did with men. However, the Word of God going out to men and women's hearts as they read it and understood it, it shed light upon their pathway and changed the course of history. E.M. Bounds rightly says, Men are looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. God's plan down through history has been to find individuals who will surrender themselves to God and that He can use to spread the gospel. It's on us tonight. Through your life and through mine, God has a plan and a purpose for every individual. You might say, preacher, I don't feel very talented. I don't feel like I can do very much. I can't talk. I can't this. You go through the list of all the can'ts. I'm tired of the can'ts. Find what you can do and do it. You might can be a doorkeeper. You might could sweep the floors. You might be able to write. You might could do some other task. Because the Bible says that the church is a body. Every member has its function and its place. You need to find your function and your place in the kingdom of God. And in the path of history, history has pointed to men and women who were greatly used of God. They had an encounter with God and it totally changed their life. The world was changing during the time of Martin Luther for some centuries. The world was kept under the grip of Rome or Roman Catholicism. The Pope actually controlled entire nations. Most of Europe was really more in a tribal state. There were tribes of people. They were warring tribes that conquered one another. One would rise and go and conquer an area. It was before the lines were drawn that we see today, Germany, Switzerland, England, uh, Scotland, you go through all of this, long before those lines ever existed. It was tribes, and various tribes were evangelized by missionaries. And yet even at that, there was a lot to learn. Many of them were not so much given the Word of God, but rather the churches came in, set up uh, centers of learning, built churches, appointed leaders. And so these people of these nations were bound to this church to come and to receive communion, to receive the various institutions of the church. And when a person stepped out of line with the Pope or did, in essence, the Pope could unchristianize that person. He could cut them off from the church, not allow them to have the sacraments, not even allow them to come to the church, if you please. As history rolled along, with one another. Language groups began to come together and you began to see the formation of one tribe into a nation, another, though, of course, the arbitrary lines that we see today 
weren't necessarily effective then. It was whoever could hold control and sway over those areas. Let's see, Dale, you're a Gossard, so you would be what? German? Is Gossard German? And then you've got Moosegotcher, which is... German. Is that German? Boy, we're getting overloaded with Germans already. And then you have Woodard, which is Heinz 57. And whatever you are. <laughs> All of us came from somewhere. But you had these various nations. Now, the Reformation, the spiritual center of the Reformation, what cannot be denied is that a lot of the Reformation was not just based solely on spiritual grounds, but as people came together as nations and as peoples and became loyal to their people and to their lands, there began to rise a sentiment against being controlled by entities outside of their country. And so the Germanic peoples, the Saxonies, up into Switzerland, you can move across all the spectrums. They began to grow weary of the money being taken from the people, sent off to some foreign pope, and during this time the Roman Catholic Church became extremely wealthy, and I'm fixing to tell you how it happened. But the Pope could extract the wealth of the people, pull it to Rome. He could build beautiful buildings and furnish himself. In fact, it became so uh, strong that the Popes became so materialistic. And of course, the that they ceased taking care of the spiritual needs of the people and simply became a business and at the heart of the controversy, what led to the controversy and gave to the rise of Luther was something called the selling of indulgence. <clears throat> Maybe uh, let's pass the offering plate before I tell you about them. Maybe I could sell a few tonight. So let me give you kind of the idea of the indulgence system. You know what, before I get into that, you had the Germans, the Germans was given their Greek New Testament, and then of course the Bible began to be interpreted into various languages, and as it went out, it became the tool of awakening to the people of those lands. Now, Germany at that time had no powerful national ruler to protect their interests. And so it was easy for the Pope to get money from her. The papacy could draw a lot of money from them. And the opening up of mines in Germany created a lot of wealth. And the papacy wanted to tap into this wealth. The Roman church also owned a lot of land in Germany. In addition, the German middle class, and there's another aspect that I want to bring in here. You know, we in America don't realize how blessed we are. We don't understand the world of ancient Europe, out east. When I go to uh, India... It's mind-boggling to me. It's shocking. America has something called the middle class. Now, if you listen to all the liberals, if you listen to the media, which I would encourage you to turn them off, Amen. if you listen to all of those clowns, they would make you think that you have all the wealthy class. You know that guy Bernie Sanders? Got all the wealth out here. And then you got all the peasants down here. And if you make me president, I'll become wealthy. No, he doesn't say that. 
Did you know that just recently they were really riding him because he's bought a third house, I believe it is, and now they found out his wife was uh, involved in a scandal at some college, and I'm not going to get into politics any more than I have. But I'll just say this. Folks, one of the greatest blessings that we know of is that we have the ability to determine our own destiny. And I want to tell you something tonight, like this or not. If you'll get up in the morning and take a shower and brush your teeth and go to work and work and apply yourself, did you know you can make a pretty decent living? You can. Now I know I'm kind of a little bigoted and narrow-minded in my views, but I just really believe, you know, my grandfather, and I'm not saying that they're all wrong, okay? Don't, don't take this to its extreme. My grandfather hated the union system, unions. And I'll tell you why. Not because he believed that it was wrong to get paid a good wealth, a good wage. But here's what my grandfather said. He had sat across the table from me, and he looked at me and he said, I want to yourself valuable to your employer. They'll pay you what it takes to keep you around. Now, that's what he taught me. And uh, uh, I know that different people, if, if young people will go get a decent education or learn a trade, did you know there's a lot of good jobs out there? But in the ancient world, they didn't know that. Whoever owned the land controlled the society. But about the time of the Reformation, you had the rise of what is called the middle class. And let me tell you something. If a person can provide for himself and put food on his table... You can't control that person very easily. They're hard to control. That's the reason why revolutionary movements try to get control of health care and try to get control of housing and try to get control of all of these items of your life until you have to go beg the government to take care of you. That isn't God's plan. America was founded on an individualistic system. And it basically said if you will go and you will apply yourself, you can make a decent living. And Paul the Apostle said, having food and raiment, therewith be content. Hmm. Well, this rise of the middle class this bondage to the Romish papal system, there began to be a, a, an atmosphere develop where people began to question, how can I be saved? And the man and the hour came together in the 16th century in Germany. Germany found Luther, in whom all the forces of opposition to Rome could be concentrated in a declaration of spiritual independence. Up to 1517, Luther went through a formative period. At the end of this period, he was critical of the indulgence system. I'm going to tell you about that. Between 15 and 8, 1518 and 1521, he was forced to break with the church. 1522 to 1530 was a period of organization. So when you see churches called Lutheran churches, these are followers of Lutheranism. From 1531 to the Peace of Augsburg in 1555, Lutheranism led by Luther. And after his death, his friend Melanchthon faced an air of conflict with the Roman church and consolidated its gains. Now, Martin Luther was born November 10th, 1483. He was born in Germany, and his father was a free peasant stock. He gained wealth 
from the copper mines of that area in which he had an interest and became a man of considerable wealth. Now he owned shares in six copper mines and two smelters by 1511. Times, though, were still difficult for the family when Luther was born. He was raised under strict discipline. He, was, he told himself of being whipped by his mother until the blood came because he had stolen a nut. One morning at Latin school at Mansfield, he was whipped 15 times. And his parents, particularly his pious but superstitious mother, inculcated many of the superstitions of their class to him. And he struggled with these through his youth, some of them creating terrors that haunted him as he sought for salvation for his soul. His love of hard work, his strong will, and his practical conservatism became the foundation of his life very early. He went to a school called the Brethren of the Common Life in Magdeburg, and then Luther was sent to school in Eisenach between 1498 and 1501. And I might mispronounce some words, so if I do, please forgive me. He received instruction in Latin. And then at 1501, at the University of Erfurt, he began to study the philosophy of Aristotle under the influence of teachers who followed the ideas of William of Ockham. William of Ockham had taught that revelation was the only guide in the realm of faith and reason was the guide to truth in philosophy. Therefore, Luther's studies at Erfurt made him aware of the need of divine intervention if people were to know spiritual truth and to be saved. In 1502, he received a Bachelor of Arts in 1505, he was granted the degree of Master of Arts. I want to stop a moment. Let me break that last statement down. Revelation was the only guide to the realm of faith. Reason was the guide to truth and philosophy. Now you might say, what does all that mean? Well, let me just tell you this. So in the old Roman papal system... Salvation was not a matter of faith in God, but rather faith in the church. Are you with me? It goes like this. Good morning, Dale. You were baptized in the Roman Catholic Church at eight days old. You were received into the church in baptism. You're partaking of the communion. Therefore, because of all of this, you're guaranteed heaven. No encounter with God. No experience of salvation. It hasn't changed, in case you're wondering. This is their system. I, I mean, go talk to them. I just spoke to the priest earlier today. And uh, tomorrow morning, I have a funeral at the Catholic Church. They're going to put over the casket a pall. They're going to sprinkle it with water, symbolizing the baptism that he received, which made him into the church, thereby, in essence, the only way into heaven was to be a member of their church. Do you wonder why there are Catholic cemeteries? A number of years ago, we had a family that we were that we were working with, we would go and visit, and they were from New York. And I love to go talk to the people from New York because they would tell me about being from New York. And uh, this lady said one day, she uh, went to her priest and said, I want to get married. The priest said, you can't marry so-and-so. Why not? Because if you marry him, you can't be buried in a Catholic cemetery. She said, why do I want to be buried in a dumb Catholic cemetery? Uh, by the way, she hadn't learned the art of speaking nice yet. 
And the priest said, well, if you're not buried in a Catholic cemetery, you won't go to heaven when Mary comes back for all the saints. She said, well, can I go later? <laughs> so she said, forget it then. I don't have to be buried in a Catholic cemetery, but I want to marry him. So they went and got married, I guess. I think the priest actually ended up doing it. If I, I can't remember the outcome. But what am I talking about? You see, salvation was through the church. And by nature then, if you crossed the church, guess what? They could excommunicate you, and guess what? You wouldn't go to heaven. Now you're going to go to hell. Oh, I don't want to go to hell. Okay, I'll do whatever the church tells me. Are you following me? Luther became awakened to the fact that he did not have to have the priest mediate between him and God. But that he could have a direct encounter with God himself. We call that divine revelation. You see, the world was questioning, how do I get saved? And everybody said, well, the only way to salvation is to go to the church, be baptized, partake of the sacraments, go through all of these rituals, uh, do the rosary, all of these things, and then you can go to heaven. Oh, don't forget, after you die, your family has to pay money to the priest to pray you out of purgatory, which is not even a biblical doctrine. There is no such place as purgatory. Well, Luther became troubled about it. What in the world do I do? Luther's father wanted him to study law, but in 1505, Luther became frightened during a severe thunderstorm on the road near Stoddernheim and promised St. Anne that he would become a monk if he were spared. His growing concern about his soul was brought to focus by, the, by this experience. His father told him it'd be a trick of the devil, but about two weeks later, he entered a monastery of the Augustinian order at Erfurt. Mark that down in your mind. That's going to be very important down the road. In 1507, he was ordained and celebrated his first Mass. <clears throat> what is the Mass? The Mass is the belief that Jesus is being sacrificed in the Mass. Brother Rob and I were talking this morning in the communion, the belief is, is that you are eating the literal body and the literal blood of Jesus Christ. And that the priest turns it into that while he's up there chanting and doing all of this. Well, during the winter of 1508, he taught theology one semester at the new university that had been founded in Wittenberg by Frederick, the elector of Saxony. His studies were mainly theological, but these studies only made his soul struggle the more. But he found some help in the admonitions of the godly Johann von Stoppitz. And he urged him to trust God and study his Bible. In the winter of 1510 and 1511, he was sent to Rome on business for his order. While there, he saw the corruption and the luxury of the Roman church and became aware of its need of reform. He spent much time visiting churches and viewing the relics that were in Rome, and he was shocked at the lightness of the priests who could say several masses while he said one. Luther was transferred to Wittenberg in 1511, and here during the next year, he became a professor of Bible and received his Doctor of Theology degree. Luther began to lecture 
in the common language on the books of the Bible. And he began to study the original languages of the Bible. He developed the idea that only in the Bible could true authority be found. Just a minute. Let's stop a moment again. In Roman Catholic faith, authority is in the church. Are you following me? Do you know what that means? Here's how it goes. You open the Bible. When you open the Bible, the Bible has something in it. I'm trying to find something. Here's a good one. I just opened it here. 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Now concerning the things whereof ye wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Hey, there's a good one, isn't it? Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Can I interpret that for you? Hug your husband and wife. Don't go around hugging everybody else. Well, that's good preaching, ain't it? Now, you read that, how do I interpret that? Oh, I know, I'll go ask my priest. And their belief is, the Bible is true in so much as it is interpreted by them. You can't read the Bible. You can't study it yourself and come to know the truth. You must go to them. They are the authority. Now what has happened is down through the years, you go clear back to the beginning, down through the years, the Pope would make new decrees. One of the big ones that bothered Martin Luther was when he decreed that priests could no longer get married. They must live a celibate life. That bothered Luther. Because the Bible says, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. And it also says that in the last days there would be doctrines of devils forbidding some to marry. But because the Pope said, no more marriage for the priest. He's the authority. We have to follow. You following me? And Luther came to say, wait a minute. The authority is the word of God and the church must bend to the authority of the word, not the Bible bend to the authority of the church. Following where I'm going with all this? So that's where Luther was. Luther was wrestling with this. Well, in 1517, Johann Tetzel was a wily agent of Archbishop Albert, and he began his sale of indulgences at Jutterbach near Wittenberg. Albert, are you listening? Was to receive half of the proceeds to pay off the loan from the Fugger bankers, while the other half was to go to Leo X to pay for the building of St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. Albert was too young, according to the rules of the church, to be ordained an archbishop. However, because he was talented and could get a lot of money, the church bent the rule and said, we're going to ordain him anyway. Tetzel claimed that repentance was not necessary for the buyer of an indulgence and that the indulgence gave complete forgiveness of sin. Let me break that down. An indulgence. So you call the pastor. It's Friday night. Pastor, I would like to go up tonight and live a raucous, immoral life. I'm going to go see some prostitutes. I'm going to go do all this. Okay, I'll tell you what. You give me a thousand dollars and I'll give you an indulgence to go engage in your sin and you won't even have to repent of it. Well, that's quite a bargain, ain't it? Just a little old thousand dollars. Now this Tetzel, Johan, was a talented salesman. Boy, he could say, the 
agreement was the Fugers, the banking family, loaned money. And so what happened was Johan was making big time money selling indulgences. People were buying them so that they could engage in sin. Without And guess what? The church... You've already you paid for your sin with your wallet. And folks, these indulgences, oh, Martin Luther became angry when he saw what they were doing. And it was that year that he went to the castle at Wittenberg and nailed his 95 theses to the door of the Wittenberg castle. And the sound of that hammer circled the globe. And that became the break with Rome. That became the sound that started a wildfire known as the Great Reformation. And out of Martin Luther's bravery, for it did take courage to do what he did, out of his bravery many began to be inspired. You mean we can stand against the church? You mean his courage encouraged others to join in and the, the movement known as Lutheranism or the Great Reformation was begun on October the 31st, 1517. Luther condemned the abuses of the indulgence system and challenged all comers to a debate on the matter. If you read the theses, the 95, it revealed that Luther was merely criticizing the abuses of the indulgence system. However, as time went along, Luther saw that there was no way to go forward and remain in the Catholic Church they must break from the Roman system. The translation into German and the printing of the theses spread Luther's ideas rapidly. Tetzel, Johann Tetzel, endeavored to use all the power of the Dominican order to silence Luther, who found support in the Augustinian order. And in this conflict in the early years of the Reformation gave rise to the charge of the rationalists that the Reformation was only a squabble of monks. Luther was ordered to debate the problem before members of his order at Heidelberg. But little came of the debate except for a widening circle of those who accepted Luther's idea. And a valuable ally who later supplemented Luther's courage with his gentle, gentle reasonableness was a man at the age of 21 by the name of Philip Melanchthon. Philip Melanchthon became Luther's right-hand man, and Melanchthon it was who picked up the torch even after the death of Martin Luther and carried on Lutheranism throughout Germany and across Europe. I'm going to cease there tonight, and we'll pick up with something very important next week, week after next week, and spread Lutheranism further yet than where we are tonight. Let's stand together. Our Father in heaven. You know the week that lies ahead for all of us. I pray, Lord, that you would bless, keep us, guide us, let us hear the voice of the Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would enlighten our pathway. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.